In the old cobblestone-lined streets of Mons, Belgium, Lieutenant Becker and his wife had an opportunity to start fresh. They were thousands of miles from their friends and family, and when they faced the stress of moving overseas, they could either lean on one another or separate. When it became clear that leaning on one another wasn't an option, they began to unpick their lives and separate from one another. But for Lieutenant Becker, his wife living separately wasn't an option. This is Conduct Unbecoming. I'm Erin, and I'm your host. Before we get too into the case today, I have a few quick notes. In addition to murder, this episode will cover acts of domestic violence. If that means this episode isn't the one for you, all good. My second note is that much of the research for this case came from a portion of the record available on the Navy and Marine Corps Court of Criminal Appeals website. The record is composed of what looks to be a good portion of the motions both the government and defense filed, but doesn't have things like transcripts. That said, the details included in those motions weren't necessarily litigated at trial. I've done my best to filter out to the lowest common denominator between the two conflicting fact patterns, and to leave a little bit of breathing room where the fact patterns conflict. I didn't incorporate every detail the record had, so for anyone who's interested in poking around the 700 pages, I've included the link in the show notes. Craig Becker enlisted in the Navy as a deep-sea diver in 1999, and later commissioned as an officer in 2007. The following year, 2008, he married Johanna Hove in Destin, Florida, fairly close to her family and where she grew up. From what I can find, Johanna went by Hannah, so that's what I'll use throughout this episode. Hannah worked as a licensed psychologist. Five years after they married, the Beckers moved to Belgium on August 2, 2013, so that Becker could serve as an aide-de-camp to a vice admiral and lieutenant general. In that role, he essentially served as an executive-level assistant. Becker was assigned to U.S. Army Garrison Benelux, a base about 25 kilometers from the city of Mons. It's a very potent and bewildering mix of jet lag, culture shock, and wondering where you packed the things that you need moving to another country. You're reliant on the people around you for really basic things like transportation until you can acquire a local driver's license and a car, groceries until you figure out where the store is and have a chance to go, and even communicating with your family back home until you're able to set up the internet, and a local number. Things are very stressful when you're living out of suitcases in a military hotel in a foreign country. And that's no excuse for what happened once the Beckers arrived. Approximately a week after checking into room 128 at the Army Lodge, Becker snooped through Hannah's emails. He found an email thread between Hannah and someone back in the United States, a friend of Becker's, someone Hannah allegedly had an affair with. Becker woke Hannah at about 11 p.m. by dragging her out of bed by her arm, and they began arguing. Becker grabbed and shoved Hannah a few times before picking her up, carrying her to the bed, and pinning her down with his hands around her neck, strangling her. When she was able to get away, Hannah ran to the front desk at about 1.30 a.m. and asked the night clerk to call military law enforcement. Within about 10 minutes, the military police arrived and found Hannah in the hotel's dining room curled up on the floor, crying. Becker was still in their room. 
Hannah told the MPs that Becker assaulted her, and they took her to another room at the hotel before removing Becker from their shared room and taking him to the barracks. At four in the morning, the police picked Hannah up and brought her to the police station, where she made a written statement to the military police, detailing what happened in the hotel room. She also reported that this wasn't their first physical altercation. She said it was the fifth or sixth time that things had gotten rough. She described an incident six weeks earlier prior to leaving the United States when Becker pushed her and she hurt her ankle. Between 12 and 14 hours later, Hannah recanted her statement. Kind of. In this second written statement, she accused the military police of incompetence, calling them useless and generally objecting to the way they treated her. She explained that she felt coerced into making that early morning statement, but her second statement didn't directly recant the facts that she'd laid out in her first. Hannah reported that in those intervening 12 to 14 hours, she and Becker participated in crisis counseling at the Behavioral Health Center on base. While they were almost certainly in a crisis that seems so fast to get the two of them in a shared space when there was an allegation of strangulation. After Hannah complained about how the military police handled the issue, she and Beckard continued the process of reconciling. But the investigation didn't just disappear. Becker described it as a living nightmare to at least one person, and he blamed Hannah for starting it. A few months later, in November 2013, an NCIS special agent interviewed Hannah, and she made a factual recantation of her August report. She said she didn't realize at the time of the incident that Becker was trying to keep her from harming herself, and that he was de-escalating the situation. The situation that he allegedly caused by pulling her from the bed in the middle of the night. She said her medicine put her in an altered state of mind and that Becker didn't choke her or hurt her in any way. NCIS and Becker's command left the matter open a few more months before the command declined to take any judicial or administrative action. Following that decision, NCIS closed their investigation. Hannah also explained to a family advocacy committee that she'd misinterpreted the incident. In the years that followed, Hannah told a friend that she recanted because she was concerned it would impact her husband's career. In the year following the incident at the Army Lodge, Hannah gave birth to their child. Predictably, that did not fix all of their relationship issues. The timeline is a little bit sketchy, but while they lived overseas, Becker continued monitoring Hannah's communications before confiscating her phone entirely. He changed the password to their joint bank account, took her credit cards and her ID cards, and controlled which clothes she wore, going so far as to throw away clothes that he didn't approve of. Separately, he took down and threw away the curtains Hannah made for their home, broke her makeup, barred her from getting a tattoo, and at some point forced her to walk the 2.1 kilometers from their apartment to the hospital while she was in some kind of pain. The redactions in the record make it a little unclear what she was experiencing, but the walk to the hospital came up a number of times. Things remained difficult for the pair, and in the summer of 2015, Hannah decided to leave Becker. She planned to stay in Belgium. She had a job, she had friends, and she enjoyed the life she'd built there. Hannah and Becker began to sleep in separate rooms, and then Hannah began living almost completely separately, staying at a new boyfriend's apartment. On September 18, 2015, Hannah and Becker brought a separation agreement to one of the Army JAG, who notarized it for them. On September 26th, Becker texted his girlfriend, quote, 
That piece of shit has the baby over at her boyfriend's. I will not take care of it. It doesn't matter. It just effing really pisses me off. A few weeks later, on the 5th of October, Becker again texted his girlfriend, describing Hannah's new boyfriend as the janitor who works with her, and clarified he was being serious. Whatever his girlfriend's response was, Becker escalated things and texted, quote, I'm the effing man. Don't you dare try to justify this cock-witted decision she made. Ha ha ha, what a goddamn idiot. I'd love to be a fly on the wall for when her parents meet him. The following day, on the 6th of October, Becker visited a local police station to report that his wife had a drinking problem. He wasn't there to report a crime, just wanted the police to make note of it. On or around October 7th, Becker stopped by his old office and picked up a bag of small, round, pink pills. The following day, on October 8, 2015, Hannah signed a lease for her new apartment. She paid her 500 euro down payment and arranged the delivery of a washer and dryer. Hannah and their infant were moving out. After setting up the soft landing place of her new apartment, Hannah had lunch with a group of co-workers and friends. She was upbeat about her fresh start and talked with the women about an upcoming trip to China. She would leave the next day on October 9th. That night, Hannah went to Becker's apartment to eat dinner with him and their child, a nightly tradition so she could be there for bedtime. Becker claims that Hannah asked to reconcile during the dinner, and that when he refused, she spiked her own glass of wine. Wine that Becker purchased just days after reporting to the police for seemingly no reason that Hannah had a drinking problem. Becker says that Hannah became drowsy and uncoordinated after spiking her own beverage, so he helped her to her room to sleep it off. Hannah fell from the seventh floor apartment window at approximately 8.51 p.m. She briefly clung to the window's edge, shouting for help. People nearby heard her screams and ran towards them. But her grip loosened, and she slid down the slanted roof while continuing to scream. She fell onto a table on the balcony two stories below her apartment, bounced from the table and over the balcony wall before plunging to the street below. Hannah survived the initial impact but lay injured on the cobblestone sidewalk, surrounded by French speakers. A bystander called for emergency services and reported twice that Hannah was pushed or thrown from the building. But the caller didn't see the push. He was repeating what another witness described. Becker said that he was on a call with his stateside girlfriend when he heard a scream. Just one. He claims he had time to return to Hannah's bedroom and opened the door in time to see her feet going out the window, and that he ran to the window in an attempt to save her. This didn't quite jive with an eyewitness report that described Hannah exiting the window feet first. It didn't quite jive with the reports that she was able to briefly cling to that window, And it didn't quite jive with reports that there were multiple and prolonged screams and shouts for help. Becker emerged from the apartment complex, still on the phone. Witnesses described him as fairly emotionless. They said he didn't appear sad and observed that he was not crying. They described Becker as walking around nervously. He gave conflicting accounts on Hannah's last words. At different times, he reported them as, you did this to me, as I am scared, and as I love you. Becker was, from what I can find, which granted is limited, the only English speaker present for Hannah's last words. By the time first responders arrived, Hannah had lost consciousness. 
while paramedics began to move Hannah into an ambulance. Becker explained to the police that Hannah committed suicide immediately after he rebuffed her attempt to reconcile. He repeated to the police that Hannah had a drinking problem. Paramedics took Hannah to a local hospital where staff began prepping her for surgery. She passed during their preparation and was pronounced dead at 11.17 p.m. Police searched the apartment and noted that they found Hannah's cell phone in the living room. Not in her bedroom, where Becker says he put her. Not in her pocket. Not in a purse. Becker also said he didn't know the pin code for Hannah's phone, but managed to to guess it correctly within 24 hours and then pointed police towards some text messages. When they compared Becker's phone records with Hannah's, there was a curious pattern. During a six-minute period between 8.33 p.m. and 8.39 p.m., when Becker wasn't on the phone with his girlfriend, Hannah's phone sent a series of semi-suicidal messages to her new boyfriend. Beyond those text messages, investigators never recovered any kind of final note. Becker reported that Hannah had been drinking wine on the night of her death. But her toxicology panel revealed drugs, not alcohol, in her system. She tested positive for zolpidem, midazolam, and a high level of tramadol. Zolpidem is a sedative that comes as small, round, pink pills. Just like the pills Becker picked up the day before Hannah's death. Midazolam is usually only used in hospitals, and it's used for anesthesia induction. Tramadol is a morphine-based pain reliever. The drugs make a person tired, sleepy, groggy compliant. A defense expert later offered that if Hannah consumed three glasses of wine over four and a half hours, and if she had a higher elimination rate, a full stomach, and if her body continued processing alcohol for some time after her death, that could explain why the toxicology reports came back negative for alcohol. That's a high number of ifs, and ultimately the defense expert couldn't offer an estimate of how much alcohol Hannah drank, if any. To put it bluntly, Hannah's actions on the day of her death weren't consistent of what anyone expects from someone preparing for suicide. She made future plans, committed money towards her new space for herself and her child, and looked forward to her flight the next day. 36 hours after her death, Hannah's parents arrived in Belgium from their home in Florida. They wanted to piece together what happened and to join Becker in his grief. Becker explained to them that Hannah died by suicide, that she jumped. He told them that her last words were, you did this or you did this to me. I spent way too long thinking about why Becker would say that, and how he could possibly think that supported his report that she jumped. The only explanation that I could come up with was that he meant his decision not to reconcile prompted the supposed suicide attempt, causing her to blame him in her final moments. Months after Hannah's death in March 2016, A special agent visited the Becker apartment and could still see the marks Hannah's slide down the slanted roof left. That same month, Becker was arrested and confined at a local Belgian jail. The Kingdom of Belgium was certainly entitled to investigate and prosecute a murder within its borders. But the conditions at the jail weren't great. Becker was in local custody for 119 days. For 55 of those days, the prison guards were on strike, which necessitated intervention by the Belgian army. The reduction in staff made it difficult to maintain hygiene, to maintain food rations, to maintain visits, to maintain outdoor time, 
and to facilitate meetings with Becker's defense team. Becker was the only American at the facility, and he reportedly received threats because of it. The conditions at the jail didn't meet the Department of Defense standards, so the solution was to either move him to a facility capable of meeting DOD standards, or release him from confinement. Becker got a bit of both, and he was released to house arrest on July 15, 2016. He was required to wear a monitoring device and was not permitted to leave his apartment for any reason. Another service member came by once a week with groceries and his mail and removed Becker's garbage. Becker continued to receive his full pay and allowances while he lived under house arrest until January 9, 2018. During that time, Becker filed a federal lawsuit in the United States to prompt the U.S. to invoke jurisdiction and bring Becker stateside for court-martial. His attorney appealed to then-Secretary of State Tillerson to warn that Becker was a target for terrorism or espionage because he had expertise with nuclear weapons and a high-security clearance. The attorney warned that by not asserting jurisdiction earlier, They'd created a national security threat. Military prosecutors charged Becker for assault consummated by battery, conduct unbecoming an officer, and premeditated murder. Prior to his court-martial, Becker's counsel argued that because the government waited nearly five years to prefer charges for the strangulation incident, Becker was unfairly prejudiced. They argued that during the delay, defense lost a percipient exculpatory witness, Hannah. They relied on her recantations and her assurances to others that she just misinterpreted the incident and that Becker hadn't strangled her. I'll get more into this in the legal beagle section. At his general court-martial held in San Diego, Becker was convicted of premeditated murder one specification of battery, and two specifications of conduct unbecoming an officer. On April 30th, 2022, he was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, forfeiture of pay and allowances, and dismissal from the Navy. If you are an avid reader of the show notes, you may have noticed there were two Navy and Marine Corps Court of Criminal Appeals opinions. That's because even though Hannah died nearly a decade ago, the legal case against her husband has taken a number of twists and turns. The court-martial judge faced a bit of a quandary. Prosecutors wanted to omit alleged statements Hannah made to others prior to her death. Because Hannah was no longer available to testify to things that happened in that hotel room, prosecutors hoped her statements to friends and family about what she endured would be allowed in. The defense argued that allowing those statements in would be fundamentally unfair, a violation of Becker's Sixth Amendment rights, specifically the right a defendant has to confront their accuser. With Hannah's death, Becker couldn't cross-examine Hannah on the statements her friends and family may have testified to. The court-martial judge ruled against the government and said Hannah's statements to her friends couldn't come in. Those statements were a pivotal piece of the evidence for those domestic violence charges. So following that ruling, the government made an interlocutory appeal to the NMCCA. The problem with the statements that Hannah made to her friends about what happened in the hotel room was that they were all hearsay. Hearsay is an out-of-court statement that someone is offering to prove the truth of the matter asserted. I apologize to every lawyer who doesn't litigate and who just had terrible flashbacks to either their evidence class or their preparation for the bar. Here, the government wanted to offer Hannah's out-of-court statements to her friend to prove what Becker did to Hannah at the hotel that night. 
Hearsay doesn't come in, unless it's subject to an exception. There are a lot of exceptions to hearsay, and today we'll talk about forfeiture by wrongdoing. There's a simple way to get around hearsay. It's to bring in the witness that witnessed the thing, and they can testify to what they saw, instead of relying on statements they made to someone else about what they saw or experienced. Remember when the defense argued that the government's delay in prosecuting the strangulation resulted in prejudice for his defense because they lost an exculpatory witness in Hannah? This forfeiture by wrongdoing probably ties into an underlying question you may have asked. Are they for real? I admire the pluck they had arguing that the victim of the murder Becker was on trial for would have testified on his behalf had she still been alive. Military Rule of Evidence 804b6 provides an exception to hearsay that's commonly referred to as forfeiture by wrongdoing. It allows in hearsay when the statement is offered against the defendant that wrongfully caused the speaker to be unavailable, but they had to intend to make the speaker unavailable. The government argued that Hannah's statements to her friends about the domestic violence in August 2013 were statements offered against Becker, and that Becker's murder of Hannah caused her to be unavailable to testify to the domestic violence. But the hinge point is that extra piece of MRE 804b6, the piece that required that Becker intended to make Hannah unavailable to testify to the domestic violence. The court-martial judge found that Becker's motive to commit murder was related to a lot of things, but preventing her testimony about the domestic violence wasn't one of them. When the interlocutory appeal came before the NMCCA, they reversed the court-martial judge, pointing to facts they believed showed Becker may have thought Hannah would initiate another investigation into the strangulation. But appellate courts don't get to go around making findings a fact. So the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces determined that the NMCCA improperly substituted its own fact-finding for the court-martial judge, when the NMCCA concluded that there could be many reasons Becker murdered his wife, including preventing her from testifying about the domestic violence. CAF concluded that the court-martial judge's findings of fact were not erroneous, and that it was not an abuse of discretion for the judge to find that Becker didn't kill Hannah in order to prevent her from testifying regarding the strangulation. Caff kicked the case back down to the court-martial judge to continue trying it, without the statements from her friends about the domestic violence incident at the hotel in 2013. In preparing for subsequent appeals, Becker made at least 10 motions for more time to file his appellate brief, and a series of motions to compel post-trial discovery. The motions for post-trial discovery relate to the judge's retirement employment plans. Becker, through his counsel, argues that the judge's job applications may demonstrate a bias that should have made him recuse himself. Counsel for Becker sought copies and material related to any federal job applications the judge may have submitted while serving as a judge on the case. It appears the judge has begun working for the Department of Veteran Affairs. From what I gather, defense argued that it might be a problem that the judge was going to work for the executive branch when he retired from the armed services. NMCCA didn't see any reason that it might create bias, and I don't either. Becker's counsel promised that if they were granted a 10th extension, they'd file their appellate brief in September 2023. I held off covering this case for the entire first year of Conduct Unbecoming, anticipating additional appellate opinions, but I got a little impatient. Becker's attorney remains confident his conviction will get overturned. I'll be sure to update you as the case continues to unfold. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it.
I invite you to submit case suggestions and feedback to conductandbecomingpod at gmail.com or on conductandbecomingpod.com. Join me next time when we dig into second jobs in North Dakota. Until then, take care. Conduct and Becoming is a podcast where I get to talk about interesting crimes and cases that involve U.S. military service members. I research, write, and produce the podcast myself. The opinions expressed are my own, and perhaps it's obvious. Conduct and Becoming is not approved, authorized, or endorsed by the Department of Defense.